chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 is where we will be this morning. In February of 2016, a man was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. Now, that might seem pretty commonplace today, but what actually happened almost seems impossible to believe. Some poor employees at a Wendy's drive-thru in Florida got the shock of their life. A man came through the drive-thru in a pickup truck and they handed him his beverage. After they handed him his beverage, they turned around to grab his food for him. And as they turned around to grab the food, the man proceeded to grab a live alligator and toss it through the window of the drive-thru. Yes, this actually happened in Florida. And then he sped off. Now, praise God, nobody was hurt. But can you imagine that shift? That would be one to remember. <laughs> it almost seems impossible to believe that that could even happen. And today, I want to talk to you about something that seems almost like you would say, no way, that couldn't happen. But it's far more serious. Today we're going to be talking about what seems nearly impossible. Jesus asks us, the church, to advance his kingdom. The few, the outnumbered, are supposed to go into a world that is hostile, in opposition to us, that loves their own sin, and we Ordinary people whom God has transformed are supposed to go and do this with all of our weaknesses, with all of our shortcomings, our fears, our, our anxieties that we have, and face the potential of real loss, persecution, and even death. You almost wouldn't believe that this is what is act of, asked of us unless you read it for yourself. Now God is going to ask us to march out into the world and share the hope of Jesus Christ with people so that souls might be saved. And we might say, yes, this does not seem possible. How could God ask us to do this? But he doesn't ask us to do it in our own power. He asks us to do it by his power. And today, I want to stir our hearts to the mission that God has called us to as we seek to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people around us who so desperately, desperately need Jesus. Do you believe people need Jesus today? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide us through this text this morning. We ask that the Holy Spirit would give us understanding and illumination. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us, that he would convict us not of just understanding, but a deep desire to obey the word. Father, we thank you that even though we are weak, you are strong and your son, Jesus Christ, who died to save us, has called us to a mission. Help us to understand this text today and to live it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's look at the text. Matthew chapter 9 is where we're going to be. And just before I read that, um, I'll ask you, what is the mission of the church, right? I mean, that is a question, and I believe that the Bible makes it absolutely crystal clear what the mission of the church is. In the book of Matthew, in the very last chapter, Matthew 28, Jesus tells his disciples the following. In verse 19, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So our mission is clear. We are to go and make disciples. That is evangelism. We are to see 
that people are converted and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to disciple them, to baptize and to teach them to be obedient to God's word. We're to do this with all the nations and Jesus will be with us always as we go forth. Now, I don't believe for a second that it's we lack the knowledge of what we are called to do. I don't think that's the problem often, but rather it's just that we don't do it. We get so busy, even in the church, that we busy ourselves with other things rather than the mandate and the mission that God has given us, which we call the Great Commission, to go and make disciples and to disciple them. So how do we look, how do we succeed in this mission? And one of the things that I appreciate is that we have the source of authority on how to accomplish that mission. It's called the Word of God. That's where we get our answers. That's where truth is found. And so, Matthew 9, 35 to 38, let's read verse uh, 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. So, Jesus, in, Ch in Matthew chapter 9, and I think it's really important that we understand that c Scripture should not be taken a, a one verse in isolation. Context is critical. So, in this passage, Jesus, chapter 9, Jesus heals people who are paralyzed, speaks of forgiving sin, calls a disciple, raises a girl from the dead, heals a woman, gives sight to blind men, cures people unable to speak and casts out demons. That's just chapter nine. I hope, I hope that that really makes you see just how amazing Jesus really is. I hope you love Jesus because he's awesome. Now, he is without a question, the hero. Of scripture. And so Matthew tells us that Jesus is on his own divine mission as he went throughout the cities and the villages, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and affliction. The first thing that we notice here is that Jesus went to both the cities and the villages. So I think that there's just this universal truth that Jesus was bringing the gospel for everyone, everywhere. People in a city need Jesus. People in a village need Jesus. Wherever God has called you, you're called to proclaim the gospel. That's why John 3.16 talks about this grand scope of things. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so, now, Jesus goes to the synagogues first. Why to the synagogue first? Well, because this is a place where people would have been or should have been the most naturally prepared to hear about Jesus. And so, Israel should have recognized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all that is promised in the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, you will see that it is foreshadowing all that is fulfilled in the New Testament in Christ. But sadly, many didn't. They rejected him. On the other hand, many did. And they followed him. And you know, I got thinking about that, that even in the church today, it's really, it's true. People could sit here potentially week after week, hearing the glorious truth about Jesus and just tune it out. They could never really truly commit to following the mission. It would be a sad thing if the church becomes apathetic to the great truth of the gospel. That would be a truly sad thing. And that's what had happened in Jesus' day. And I will tell you, we are in danger of such a thing if our hearts are not continuously refreshed in the scriptures. We need to be reminded about the gospel. 
So Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. Now, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, a, go a gospel, you may have heard, means good news. And so Jesus is preaching the good news of the kingdom. What exactly is the good news? Well, to understand that there is good news, we must also realize that the good news comes from the reality of bad news. See, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God made this world and everything in it, including all of humanity. The first people, Adam and Eve, they sinned against God by disobeying him. And when they did, because of their sin, their relationship with God was broken. Separated from a perfect holy God by their sin, death entered into the world. And it isn't just physical death, but it's an eternal separation, a spiritual death, where a person who is a sinner who rejects Jesus Christ will end up in the lake of fire for all eternity. And this is a true thing that the scriptures teach. Now, that was bad news for Adam and Eve, but because all have sinned, Romans 5.12 says this, sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. If any one of us were to stand before a holy God without Jesus Christ, we would be found guilty of our sin. Now that's terrible news because sin condemns us. But now isn't this what we're talking about here? There's good news. So sin is devastating. It's ruinous. It's just a tragedy. But the reality is there's this good news. The gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4 sums up the good news this way. It says, I delivered to you of the first importance what I received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. See, the good news is that because of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we can have eternal life and forgiveness of sin. God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to rescue us from sin. Jesus came and lived the perfect life of obedience that we never could. We fall short. Jesus came and died on the cross for our sin. Taking the penalty of sin. God's wrath against sin upon his shoulders. Not his sin, our sin. And by the way, when he died on the cross, he did not stay dead. He rose again the third day. And he has ascended to the right hand of the Father. Romans 5.10 says this, While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. How much more that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? So that great news of the good news is that even though we are sinners, we can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. We must turn from our sin. We must repent and believe that Jesus did what he did, that he died on the cross for our sin and rose again. We must ask God to forgive us of our sin. But when we do, we will know that we have been changed from sinner to saint because we are forgiven by God. And our destiny is changed. We were hell-bound now we're heaven bound. What a glorious truth that is. Now, why is it called? Or sorry, before I say that, I should say this. I don't take it for granted that every person sitting here knows Jesus Christ. You can show up in a church and it doesn't mean that you know him personally. You must personally turn from your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the glorious truth is today, you can be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And if that, if it is on your heart today and you want to deal with your sin and know Christ as your Savior, I know that any of the elders here would be glad to talk with you. I'd be glad to talk with you. But our burden and our heart is that you know Christ personally. Don't leave today in danger of perishing. Now, the gospel of the kingdom, it is in t and it's called the gospel of the kingdom because it's entirely a work of God, a divine kingdom, not a kingdom of this world and by his grace. The king of kings is the one who saves us. And you don't earn your way to heaven. By the way, if you've ever been told that you can earn your way to heaven, that is a lie. The Bible says this in Ephesians 2. By grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not the result of works so that no one can boast. You have to come humbly to Jesus and ask him to save you. Now, Jesus went throughout the region with this message of good news. And he authenticated his message by healing people to show that he was capable of forgiving sin and granting people eternal life. And I want to say this very clearly here. In spite of what the world teaches, Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom because there is only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. That's why John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Let's read a little more. Verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, sharing, I, I think most of us would probably realize this, but we will say this, sharing the gospel is not easy. In fact, it can be very difficult because we can face very significant opposition. And that does make us sometimes fearful of doing evangelism. People are, can be rude, angry, dishonest, and cruel. And... The natural position of man is not to want to be saved. And they're not interested in the gospel naturally. They only become interested in the gospel when the Holy Spirit is working on them. But John 3.19 says this, People loved the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. That, that's a reality that we face. The world is harsh but sadly, some Christians think that because the world is harsh, we have to fight back harshly against it. And the truth is, we should have deep compassion for people because they are blind. Even in their anger and cruelty, they are blind. And I love Jesus' approach. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. The Greek word for compassion here carries with it a, an idea of a deeply felt within the very fiber of your being, this depth of compassion. So Jesus looks out and he sees the people and he just has so much compassion for them. Now Jesus did something we never could. His compassion goes all the way to the reality that he dies on a cross for sinners. What great compassion that is. But we as followers of Christ should be compassionate because we were once those people. Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians, says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If we ever want to be effective in the ministry of the gospel of the kingdom, then we need to be people 
of compassion. Jesus demonstrated both a practical, physical compassion for people. And I think that that's a great gateway for us. But he was also obviously primarily concerned about their spiritual needs. However, I will tell you, those two go hand in hand. You need both. You need both kinds of compassion. I like what James says. He says, if one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? Why proclaim Christ to somebody if you don't care about them in their need? And Jesus showed that to us. And so one of the realities is that gospel proclamation doesn't require us to be standoffish, but to actually get our hands dirty in a world full of messy sinners whose lives are difficult. And it's uncomfortable. But look what Jesus did. He saw them and he saw that they were harassed and helpless without any hope. Now there's a deep implication here in this. These people were around all of the religious leaders of their day. They had the synagogues. They had the temple. They had the Pharisees. They had the Sadducees. They had all these people that were there to supposedly guide them. And yet, they were harassed and helpless. Helpless to deal with their sin and their burdens. And I think you should think about this here in this city, that there might be a hundred churches in this area and temples and mosques and all these things. And people will say, well, look, oh, we're such a religious people. But people can be surrounded by religion and absolutely helpless and drowning because they need only one thing. They need Jesus Christ. And there are people out here right now putting false burdens upon people. And we must cry out to sinners, come to the refuge and the rock, which is Jesus Christ. That is compassion. Jesus, being the great shepherd, saw that these people were like sheep without a shepherd. That they were in danger from the wolves, in danger in the wilderness, going down the wrong path. And they may not have even been aware. And that's the reality of sinners. It doesn't matter how comfortable your life is. It doesn't matter how much money you have or secure your job is or how much your life seems together. Because without Jesus, you will die in your sin. So Jesus has compassion on them. And that's what the Great Commission calls us to do. It calls us to go and make disciples by proclaiming the gospel and caring for people deeply. And let's read the last two verses. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, Jesus says this to his disciples. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. And when you look at the sheer staggering number of people in this area, it can be overwhelming. In this region, there are millions of people all around in this region. And I would say it seems impossible to fulfill the mission of the church just due to the simply the overwhelming numbers and on top of that the workers are few what can we a handful of people do about the dire spiritual need of so many souls but let me ask you this question can Jesus tell a lie the answer is absolutely not. 
And if Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples, and in Matthew 16, Jesus says this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So if Jesus says, I will be with you, the mission will succeed, the numbers are irrelevant. The odds are irrelevant. Jesus wins. And everyone who follows him wins. Because we are residing in his victory. And I look at this church in particular, and God has really put that burden on my heart to express this to you. That in this church alone, the nations are represented. Praise God. But that means that you are also positioned to reach all the nations that land at the doorstep of this community. God can use you mightily. But don't try to do it in your own power. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. That's never changed. Do we believe that all everybody who's ever going to be saved is already saved right now? No. In the sense that we need to go and share the gospel, right? God in his sovereignty knows who are his. But from our point of view, we don't know who will trust Christ. And we believe we can go out there and share that with them. There's always a harvest. But there's a little bit of an unexpected twist here. See, many times in evangelism, we think that it's a matter of motivating ourselves. I grew up in the age where they had these things called records. And I used to listen to this little storybook called The Little Engine That Could. And the story is about this engine who has to go up this mountain, and it's a difficult mountain to climb. And the whole story is based on him going, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And finally he does it. Hooray! Woo! And Jesus says, put the brakes on your enthusiasm. You know, if you picture Jesus as the locker room coach going, all right, guys, we're going to get out there and win that game. That isn't actually appropriate. Jesus isn't hyping us up. Jesus just tells them matter of factly, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. That's a God-sized problem. And it comes with a God-sized solution. And then he says this. And that's, I think this is one of those things you can't miss. It's so important. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into his harvest. You know, we want to just go out there and be like, yeah, let's take the hill. And that's good. But the deeper question here isn't do you have enough motivation to do the gospel work? The question is, are you surrendered to the Lord God and do you trust him completely? I'll tell you why. Because when it comes to prayer, prayer is vital. Prayer is an act of worship. Prayer is dependency upon God. Total surrender. It's saying, not my will, but yours, O Lord. If Jesus says that the mission will succeed and the harvest is is plentiful, why don't we go? What, What is stopping us right now? Often it's because we don't believe God at his word. And the only way to cure that is prayer and in the word. Prayer is communing with God. It is depending on Him for power, for strength, to overcome temptation, to stay focused on the mission, to leave your anxieties with Him. It's to have a heart of gratitude, to ask to grow, to confess sin. See, here's the truth. When we pray 
that the Lord of the harvest would send out the workers into the field, we become those workers. Because God works on us. Without prayer, you will never succeed in evangelism. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So when we go and do evangelism without first committing it to prayer, guess what happens? We get enthusiastic, but the motivation wears off. God's field, God's harvest. We need him to direct us and keep us focused. That God would give us both the mission and the means by his sovereign power should fill us with great confidence. Can we take this area here with the sheer number of souls that need Christ by a, just by human effort? I think we can't. I think we can't. But can we, as God's people, pray? And as we pray, find that God changes our hearts, our attitudes, and empowers us and gives us great success? We know he will. We know he will. As Jesus showed us, proclaim the gospel, have deep compassion for people, and pray. And I believe that you will see the harvest that the Lord has prepared. And so I only want to say this in closing, really, is to stay on mission. I want to tell you what I did just before I came here. Uh, there's a, a, a beautiful lady in our church who's unfortunately has stage four cancer. And she's coming to the end of her days. And I remember my wife and I, we saw her a, a few weeks ago, several weeks ago, and she said, I only want one thing. I want my life to be a testimony and to bring God glory in these last days. Now, Kim and I got to visit her just before we came here. She is an absolutely weakened husk of what she once was. She's frail. She can't get out of bed. She struggles to talk. And she says, I want to bring God glory and be a witness for Jesus. How is that even possible that such a weak vessel would be used? And the reality is that because of her prayer and her obedience to God, she has witnessed to all of her nurses all of her PSWs, her family, her children who are not walking with the Lord. Weakness is irrelevant Amen. if you're going in God's power. The impossible becomes possible with God. And if a person in that weakened state can do that, Imagine what God does with his church when they surrender in full obedience. Yeah. Acts 1.8 You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We praise you for your glorious glorious truth that your son Jesus came with great compassion modeled for us what it means to share the good news of the kingdom and I pray that as we go in his power that this church here would not be cold to the sinners around them who desperately need Christ and Father, I pray for people individually here who know that there's that person in their life that they need to share Christ with. I pray that you give them the courage, but I pray that they would seek you first and then go. Father, I pray for a harvest of souls. And Father, I pray that even though the workers are few, that you would empower the workers to do the impossible because with you, it is possible.
And so we pray these things in the name of the one who died for us and who calls us to serve him faithfully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.